Hello and welcome. My name is Derek Kanejo, and today I'm going to be talking about behavioral finance and prospect theory. Why am I doing this? They say the best way to learn about a subject is to try to teach it. And it has been many years since I first read about behavioral finance. So I thought I'd refresh my memory and share what little that I do know. Uh, this is Daniel Kahneman. He's an Israeli psychologist. He wrote a great book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And in 2002, he won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on prospect theory. But what's fascinating is that Kahneman is not an economist. He's a psychologist. The field of behavioral finance was born on the academic work of Daniel Kahneman and his friend Amos Tversky. And behavioral finance uses psychology to explain uh, investor behavior and market inefficiencies. Let's assume that there's an outbreak of a rare disease which is expected to kill 600 people and you have two options. Option A, you can save 200 lives for sure. But if you pick option B, there's a 33% chance of saving all 600 lives with a 67% chance of saving no one. Now take a moment to decide which option you would pick. And I'm gonna guess most of us pick option A. I certainly picked option A. We now problem two, same problem, identical problem, same scenario. There's an outbreak of a rare disease which is expected to kill 600 people. You have two options. With uh, if you pick option C, 400 people will die for sure. And if you pick option D, 33, there's a 33% chance that no one dies but a 67% chance that all 600 people will die. Take a moment to decide which, uh, which option you pick. I'm guessing most of you chose option D. And by the way, if you do the math, problem one and problem two are exactly the same. The only difference is the way the questions were framed. In problem one, the choice was framed positively in terms of survivors, whereas in problem two, the choice was framed negatively in terms of deaths. So the lesson here is that, uh, you know, humans are not perfectly rational. If we were perfectly rational, we would have picked options A and C or C and D together. Uh, and you know we prefer the sure thing when making a decision that offers hope of a gain and we prefer the gamble when making a decision that uh, will lead to a certain loss prospect theory Let me just move that. so prospect theory can be summed up as losses loom larger than gains and notice that the loss function is steeper than the gain function. And what this means is that losses hurt about twice as much as gains make you feel good. And because losses are so painful, humans are suboptimally risk averse. Let's say I toss a fair coin. If the coin lands heads, you win $200. If the coin lands tails, you lose $100. Would you play this game? Paul Sam in 1963, Paul Samuelson asked this very question to his colleague. And his colleague kind of gave an interesting answer. His colleague said, yes, I'll play the game, but only if two conditions are met. Condition one, if I can play the game 100 times in a row, and condition two, if I don't have to watch 
the individual outcome. So now why did he say that? It's because he, the colleague knew that the game has a positive expected payoff, but at the same time he knew that he would not be able to handle the fluctuation in his wealth during the course of this game. And that's really interesting. And I think this also helps explain why investors hold long-term bonds. So we know that over the, over the very long term, the chance of stocks doing worse than bonds is small, just like the chance of losing money in Samuelson's 100 bet game. So why do investors still hold long-term bonds? And I think the answer is because of something called myopic loss aversion. And the word myopic simply means nearsighted. So, you know, we know that stocks are more volatile than bonds. And so the more frequent you checked your portfolio, the more frequent you will be exposed to unrealized losses. And, and because we are more sensitive to losses than gains, checking stock prices every single day is very emotionally draining. And I think this is why people sometimes irrationally hold bonds instead of stocks. And Richard Thaler sums it up perfectly. He said, the more often you look at your portfolio, the less willing you would be able to take on risk because if you look more often, you will see more losses. And I think this also explains why it is easier for investors to buy and hold real estate. It is because they are not seeing uh, fluctuations in real estate prices on a daily basis. And this is an edge that real estate investors have over equity investors. A simple solution is to simply stop checking stock prices every day. If you have to monitor your portfolio that closely, something is wrong. I think something is wrong with your strategy. Uh, fund managers can also benefit by by reporting to their clients on a yearly or quarterly basis as opposed to on a monthly basis. The ability to handle losses. This is Bill Miller. Bill Miller is a legendary contrarian investor. And at the peak of his career, he was managing, if I'm not mistaken, $77 billion in assets. Then during the global financial crisis, he made a series of bad investments. His performance suffered and investors yanked them, pulled their money out in droves. His assets under management fell by 98% from about $77 billion to about $800 million. And during this period, he said, he said it was a very tough period. He was going through a divorce. Uh, he had to let go of employees and you know, he put on a lot of weight. He said it was only so much pain a man could take. But what would happen is kind of interesting because his career bounced back after that. So he showed remarkable res res resilience in the face of adversity. And I think if you did a brain scan of the greatest value investors, I think what you'll find is that the part of the brain that processes pain and losses is stunted. This is probably why Warren Buffett and Howard Marks are so unemotional when it comes to losses. If by Rudyard Kipling is one of my favorite poems and there's a beautiful line in the poem that goes, if you, meet, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two import, imposters just the same, well, what he basically means is that you should treat extreme success and failure just the same. Uh, you know, we, investments are really part of the investment landscape. We should try to analyze why the mistakes were made so it doesn't happen again. But at the same time, we should not fret over mistakes because that can affect your ability to take risk going forward. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed it.
Thank you.